Jesse. I'm Austin. I'm Ashley. And obviously our topic is body image. So we found a really interesting statistic. <coughs> so before we start, we just wanted to do this cool little experiment thing. Oh. So um, participation would be really cool. So if everyone could just like close your eyes, and we're just going to ask one question. And if this question is like a yes to you, then you'll just raise your hand. So if everybody just close their eyes. And how, raise your hand if you're comfortable in your body today. OK, open your eyes. Okay, so if you like look around, you can see that some people are comfortable and some people aren't, and that's kind of what we wanted to show today, that everybody <coughs> is different and how people see themselves and other people are different as well. Okay. Okay, we're just going to show a little clip. This is a girl, she has a reality show on TLC called My Big Fat Fabulous Life, and she's at the class. You may have noticed by now that I'm really fat. And that's okay. You wouldn't be the first. Back in 1997, when I was in seventh grade, I heard a question posed about me in the locker room of my middle school. I sat hidden in a bathroom stall, hunched over, not wanting to give myself away, when I heard a girl ask, when was the last time Whitney saw 90210? I was like more of a Saved by the Bell girl myself, and I would actually never seen an episode of 90210, so I clenched my muscles and held my pee and waited with bated breath for the answer. And when it came, when she stepped on the scale, the girls erupted into laughter and I felt the familiar sting of embarrassment seeping into my cheeks. It took me back to my fifth grade year on the soccer field where the boys had taken to singing a song about me called Baby Beluga that ended with, she's got a whale of a tail. You might be picturing now how fat I probably was. It's easy to conjure up a mental image of an awkward girl spilling out of her shorts, running up and down the sidelines like, hey, I'm open. But if you have that mental image, you would be wrong. Because in 1995, when I was 10 years old, I looked like this. And when I look at that picture now, my heart aches because when I was just becoming aware that I had a body and that other people had opinions about my body, I became a statistic. Social media has shaped the standard society holds over men and women today. And these <coughs> models and these other stars have unrealistic body types that are influencing <coughs> normal people of today. And women aren't the only ones that feel like their bodies don't meet the social norms, though. When 29% of men think about their appearance at least five times a day. So some social ramifications that can like come along with feeling like your body isn't meeting like meeting up to par is that it's common for people to develop eating disorders, which can lead to other serious health issues, and you can have really like bad low self-esteem, which can lead to anxiety and depression. Um, Forty-two percent of girls first through third grade want to be skinnier. And all these factors can put a toll on any type of relationship that you're trying to hold with somebody. And even worse, they can lead to suicide. Overall, society needs to stop what they're doing and reconsider the bar that they're setting for men and women. Okay. So what do we expect to see out of the media? 
Because we see similar body types repeated over and over again in the media, it translates into what we expect to see in both the media and in everyday life. Basically, this means that because of the media, our sense of what the traditional or the average body type is, is structured through what we see in advertisements and commercials. But this is not the media simply being biased. According to Proton and Hoynes, content is a reflection of audience preference, meaning that the media gives us this image. We see it over and over again, and we assume, okay, that's what I'm supposed to look like, that's what she's supposed to look like, that's what he's supposed to look like. And we <laughs> so we try to attain this look, and that's the media thinking that we love this. So that's the vicious cycle. They keep showing us the image, we keep feeding off it. Media today, um, whether it be advertisements, news, or just any form of entertainment, predominantly only shows like one desirable body type. Um, all of these m models, celebrities, and even news anchors embody these body types. And when these unattainable body goals aren't met, men and women feel worthless because society places so much of their self-worth on how they look. Wait. Just go. Okay, anyways, it's not myself. Okay. Media is constantly bombarding these extreme body expectations of men and women on men and women, especially young, impressionable boys and girls. The typ typical desirable woman's body is tall, thin, and has womanly curves. <coughs> Men are expected to be muscular and tall. Um, there's a, a crazy statistic that says Americans spend 250 billion <coughs> hours a year watching TV, and 30% of that time is advertisements. So if we're constantly seeing these, this one body type, and 30% of those 250 billion hours of television, you can imagine the sort of effects that that would have on a person. So what happens to someone when they see what's in the media? After seeing the bodies that are commonly shown in the media and thinking that they don't have the <coughs> ideal body type, people can form eating disorders. And there are lots of different kinds of eating disorders <laughs> that all stem from bad body image. And while it's impossible to find the cause of each individual's eating disorder, the media plays a big role in telling us um, consciously or subconsciously, what's right and what's normal. Um, so, we have, no, sorry, it's okay. Um, so, we have some facts. Um, nine out of ten people with anorexia are female, and one in every 100 women in the United States are anorexic. In the U.S., 20 million women and 10 million men suffer from an eating disorder at some time in their life, and the incidence of bulimia <coughs> in um, women ages 10 to 39 tripled between 1988 and 1993. There has been a rise in incidence of anorexia in young women ages 15 to 19 in each decade since 1930, and the rate of development of new cases of eating disorders has been increasing since 1950. While it seems um, eating disorders are more common in girls, and most of these facts feature um, women, it might be because um, there's less research on males with eating disorders, and men have been more stigmatized from coming forward or could even be unaware that they have an eating disorder. So more research is needed, but studying studies have shown an increase of numbers in males with eating disorders, but it's hard to tell if it's just because more are coming forward and more people are aware that men have eating disorders too, or if there's actually a rise in cases of eating disorders in men. Particularly shameful in engaging in the act of binging and purging. I viewed it as something, you know, feminine. Only one in ten males will see treatment. We're ashamed. Men are ashamed. Young boys are ashamed. I want men and women to know, whether you're a teenager or a college student or middle age or getting to be an old fart like me, recovery is possible, but you have to fight through that shame. We can't let shame 
bind us into silence. Um, this is a chart from um, the National Eating Disorders org with um, ABC News, and it shows us that a staggering 30 million people in America will suffer from an eating disorder in their lifetime. That's more people than um, live in Australia. So on the female side, it's kind of hard to see, but it says 50% of women use unhealthy behaviors to control their weight. 70% of 18 to 30 year old women don't like their body. And um, there's a draw, drawing comparing the average woman to the average model. The average woman is 5'4 and 165 <laughs> pounds. The average model is 5'11 and 120 pounds. So on the male side, it says 37% of men who binge eat experience depression. And 43% of men are dis dissatisfied with their bodies. And um, the drawing here is comparing measurements to the average male and um, a GI Joe. Um, so the, um, the bicep of an average male is, uh, or the bicep size of, an, of a GI Joe is 16 inches versus the average male, which is 13. The chest of a GI Joe is 41 inches versus 39 inches, and the waist is 29 inches versus 40 inches. We, I already talked about this. Um, so what role does society have in creating this issue? We kind of already got into advertisements, but I also wanted to talk about how ads um, sexualize both men and women, but I felt like these um, examples were the most striking. So um, we see society emphasizing sexuality through such explicit and demeaning ads, and we teach young impressionable, impression, impressionable girls and boys um, that their real importance is placed in um, their sexuality and their beauty. So. Okay, so now that we talked about what happens in the media and what people see every day in their lives, we're going to move on to what actually goes on in the world and what do people actually look like in the world. There is not one person in this room that looks exactly the same as the one sitting or standing next to them. Everyone looks, talks, feels, acts, eats everything in a different way. So why would we want everyone to look the same when nobody really can or does? So these pictures um, in the top left, these women, they all have different body types and some of them are bigger than others and some of them have different skin color and different hair and that shouldn't matter, that shouldn't be what we all strive to look like, tall, blonde, big boobs, big butt, small waist, whatever, it doesn't matter. And just with men, we don't expect every single guy to have six pack rock hard abs and like you can like get a nice oil tan or like whatever, it doesn't matter. Like you should just look the way you are and like no man has to be so big or so small, it shouldn't matter in the world. So um, we have a small video. If any of you have seen That's So Raven, there's a really cool a scene. Little dance. Fun with your family. <coughs> Wait, magical once upon a time experiences. Disney <laughs> Princess Musical Dancing. Little People is a proud sponsor of Disney. <laughs> Disney. Matter is not included. Other toys sold separately. I don't pay you to think this girl does not have the luck. The luck. Who says that's the only look? You make people feel bad if they don't look like that. No one looks like that. I don't even look like that. Because in case you haven't noticed. People come in all shapes and sizes, and they're all beautiful. Tell it, girl! Speak the truth! <laughs> Be so focused on trying to be so thin because, like Mary said, it's, everyone's different. 
and then beliefs about personal control and mastery over the body. And in this study, if um, people dieted, they noticed that they were unhappier because they were trying to fit into a certain body type. So if we just keep producing these gay party campaigns, we can address this body image issue. I'm Emilia. I'm Daniel. I'm Jessica. I'm Matt. And we did the internet and privacy. <coughs> first off, why is um, internet privacy important? Well, first, it's a growing issue. It's becoming more important as time goes on. So first of all, we all have the right to privacy in the Constitution. It refers to privacy as uh, a concept that some, one's personal information is protected from public scrutiny that means that your information doesn't have to be out there for everyone to see being discriminated. And it's also uh, not only in the US, but in the UN, um, Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares that uh, privacy is an enabler uh, of the communication rights, such as freedom of expression and freedom of association. And so since it's grown so much by 2020, there's going to be an estimated 50 to 75 billion things connected to the internet. And so that's 50, 75 billion things that could potentially be sending your information to government or companies or stuff like that. Like there's been recent reports of um, some toys that have microphones in them that have been sending recordings to the toy companies. Um, and this information can be taken advantage of by marketers or the government and it could be used to infer things about these people that are being recorded. And so um, it's kind of a uh, guilty until proven innocent kind of thing where they hear something and then you just get put on the list despite you being completely innocent. And uh, anonymity coincides with privacy. With anonymity, it's, just, it's extremely important to like a democratic process. It allows for freedom of expression, freedom of uh, speech, and uh, allows you to express your ideas even if they are unpopular and allows you to be critical of government without fear of repercussion. And if you give up the right to privacy, it just leads down a very slippery slope where you're giving up more and more rights and it could lead to a situation like 1984 and Big Brother and all that. Um, some of the societal norms that we and problems related to the internet and privacy. Um, data entered into forms or contained in existing databases can be combined almost effortlessly with transaction records and records of individuals um, every click on the internet. Um, cookies is widely used to identify users at um, websites and it allows someone to collect all your information without even knowing. Um, businesses can obtain personal information such as your buying habits, email address, and the portions of the website that were looked at previously. Um, web bugs are another widely used instrument that is a threat to online tracking technology. Um, web bugs are indivisible pieces of code that secretly can track people's web travels to seeing computer files. Um, web bugs work with cookies to send information to third parties like businesses about um, your online travels. Um, there are two types of execute, two types of web bugs. Um, the first one is an executable bug, and um, this installs a file onto someone's uh, hard drives and collects information whenever they're online. Um, the second is a script-based bug, which can be installed on a user's computer and can take any document without them noticing. Um, a report shows that 16 million <coughs> pages out of 51 million that were scanned contained web bugs from an advertising network. Um, another privacy concern is that marketers can match their customer databases with the databases they get from cookies. Um, DoubleClick had already built up a database of online consumers' browsing habits by using cookies. Um, so, like I said, names and addresses can be linked with cookies. So, double click not only knew where people were online, but where they live, who they are, and their phone numbers. And <coughs> the security of credit card information for online purchases is incorporated with the privacy uh, concerns. Um, 
Vine, which is a subsidiary of Amazon.com, admitted that hackers undetected for over four months have stolen 98,000 credit card numbers, um, which leads to um, credit card fraud. So. Do you really have a private life online? <laughs> Are you going to upload that photo to the internet? Sure. You don't mind people seeing you like that? Do you think I'm stupid? My pictures can only be seen by my friends on Fiesti. How many friends do you have on Fiesti? 175. Are there other people in the photo okay with the picture being uploaded? Well, if just my buddies can see it, there's no problem. Besides, it was a party. If they let somebody take their picture, it can't be that big a deal. If you get your picture taken, is to show it off, right? Okay, but how well do you really know all of your online friends? How do you know you can trust them? Well, I don't know all of them. Some are good friends, others are acquaintances. But I decide who makes the list. Right, but any of those 175 people can copy your picture with a single keystroke and then do whatever they want to do with it. Mm, well, yeah. I guess so, but what would they do that for? And if those friends share your picture with other people? Nah, they wouldn't do that. Have you asked them not to? Do they know that you don't want other people to see that picture? They might think it's just a perfectly normal picture and that you don't care who sees it. Well, since you put it like that... But look, you're, you're driving me crazy. You're paranoid. I already configured my privacy settings and that's enough. What more do you want? And if someone sneaks into your private zone? Impossible. They'd need to steal my password. And I haven't given it to anybody. Anna made it difficult to guess. Just in case. Besides, I update my antivirus software all the time to make sure Trojans who can steal them won't get through. You're talking to a pro. And the other 175, are they also pros? They also do all those steps to make sure their information is secure. No, but... Your private space that no one can get into doesn't really sound that secure, does it? In social networks, your online privacy can be affected by others. The privacy of others also depends on you. So, um, social media has also played a huge role in internet privacy. Uh, networks such as Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and all of those have opened up a realm of uh, anonymity. Um, and this can be a dangerous thing, because uh, people of all ages can post things on these websites. Um, especially, this is especially dangerous for kids, because they um, are usually more gullible and likely to be tricked by like online predators and such. So parents definitely need to take a step in like helping their kids and um, setting up privacy settings. Um, the same thing goes for elderly people. Um, usually they're not as in touch with technology um, and have a harder time identifying like scammers or other false identities online. Um, also, advertisements may be invading internet privacy um, because they target customers using what they've uh, previously searched or other digital footprints. Um, so, social media users aren't the only ones uh, with potential access to private information. Um, the U.S. government um, also, also can um, have potential access to this information. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Edward Snowden. Uh, they made like a movie about him, but he released um, the Global Surveillance Disclosure. 
um, to the media, which was NSA documents and phone records that um, were exposed. Um, the documents include evidence that kind of suggests that the NSA might have been overstepping boundaries and um, looking into our private lives through like the internet or like phone calls or things like that. Um, some people praise him because he uh, exposed the NSA and other people say he's a traitor because um, he leaked information to other countries about the US government. Um, the media kind of portrayed him as like uh, more of a villain I feel like, but I don't know, it kind of came from like different sources and stuff. Um, so either way, he kind of um, exposed this issue of internet privacy, and I think Americans have a better idea of how much privacy they have online now. All right, so I got uh, the society's role in this issue today. Um, the internet works in technological and privacy ways, and policy ways, uh, which helps develop tools and policies that empower people to like, figure these things out uh, with their online identities, identities, as well as like the footprint, their digital footprint that they will be behind. Um, a digital footprint is a trail of data you create by using the internet. It includes every website you use, whether you're going on East Bay to order some new attire that you want or something like that, you put in all your information in there, and it's automatically saved, and that goes with your uh, footprint. Um, all the emails that you send out to people when you're communicating with people, and uh, the information that you give to online services, so that'd be the same thing with like East Bay. And then uh, when you send out your tweets, same kind of thing, Facebook, all the updates, and the photos that go on IG, people gotta like be careful with what they do, how they word things, and it'll just always be remembered. So I also got a video here for us. <coughs> Some of the biggest invasive groups are major corporations you know, Google, Facebook, Apple. Uh, these companies compile information about you from what you do on their websites and sell it to major advertising companies. So when you're online, you look at a pair of glasses, and then two weeks later, you see that same pair of glasses pop up. It's not serendipity, it's not some perfect coincidence, it's them watching. Uh, some of the worst part is that you gave them the key, which brings me to my next point uh, knowing what you're signing up for. When you sign up for these websites, you sign a bunch of agreements, you allow them access to your microphone, your location, a bunch of different stuff. And that is how they're accessing your information. So every time you uh, skip through, you know we actually like reading those things, uh, make sure that you understand what you are putting out there because you're essentially allowing them access to your privacy. Okay, so for those of you tuning in now, since we're uh, wrapping up, uh, I'll give you sort of a brief summary of what we talked about. Um, so the rise of internet popularity has generally, like overall, damaged uh, individual privacy. Um, because what you put out there will remain there, no matter where it is. Um, like, as you probably know, iCloud has been hacked multiple times. PlayStation Networks <coughs> have been hacked multiple times. Microsoft's networks have been hacked many times. So most of the stuff that you have on the internet is up for grabs by basically anyone at any time. Um, so just be careful what you put out there. Um, advertising has become much more individualized than generalized because of cookies and search, safe searches, I guess. Um, so uh, like we talked about, you know, they can see what you search and 
advertise stuff to you based on what you search. Uh, this is pretty prevalent in Amazon. Like you have your related searches or whatever. Um, and like what Max just said, don't just accept or agree with the terms and conditions, privacy policy, or um, terms of use, because a lot of the times you'll be agreeing to something you may not necessarily want to agree to. So what was the boiling point? Like what led up to the Black Lives Matter movement um, and all this hype about police brutality? So um, two cases, um, the case that happened in Ferguson with Michael Brown and uh, the case with Trayvon Martin. So basically what happened, I'm sure you guys have heard about these two cases, but I'm just going to briefly touch on them. So with uh, Trayvon Martin, he was a 17-year-old uh, black teenager who was unarmed, and he was shot by a police officer named George Zimmer Zimmerman. Um, and George Zimmerman went to jail for it, but then was released five hours <coughs> later and didn't get any charges or anything against him and was just able to walk freely. Um, and then what happened in Ferguson was an 18-year-old unarmed black man named uh, Michael Brown who was um, shot and killed by a white police officer named Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. And basically he was caught stealing something and so they were having an altercation and arguing and then Darren Wilson shot at him twice from his car and Michael Brown ran and then um, Darren Wilson shot him ten more times and was, wasn't indicted whatsoever and was able to walk freely. So I thought, you know, I knew about these cases going into this project, but I didn't know that he was shot 12 times in total. And to just think about that is really, really shocking and chilling that a human could just shoot someone 12 times. Um, so the media's role in all of this basically Obviously, we have access to more information about the topic. It's what the media is for. Um, second, social media sites created a bigger divide, so like a divide between the police and everybody else, basically the public. Um, and it created the Black Lives Matter movement. So without the media, there wouldn't even really be a Black Lives Matter movement because it started with a hashtag on Twitter and blew up into this whole entire gigantic movement and everyone kind of jumped on board with it. Um, but since then there have been people who have been using the hashtag all lives matter or blue lives matter and basically all lives matter is a response saying like well everybody else matters, all races matter too. And then, <coughs> which makes sense but they're kind of missing the whole purpose of Black Lives Matter is to just focus on people of color right now because of their discrimination and how they have been discriminated for many, many years. So these are a couple tweets basically just kind of like showing how um, people talk about this all over the media. So there's one where he says, I'm not going to stand for this no more. Tonight we purge. Kill all the white people in the town of Lap Lada. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, and then there's one, this girl <coughs> saying, meet the new KKK. They call themselves Black Lives Matter, but make no mistake, their goals are far from equality. Hashtag Dallas, hashtag Blue Lives Matter. And then also Blue Lives Matter is basically just supporting the police through all of this. Um, and then another one says, 
Do people who change hashtag Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter run through a cancer fundraiser going there are other diseases too? What the F is the impulse behind changing Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter? Do you crash strangers' funerals shouting, I too have felt loss? So basically, like, what that last one is basically stating is that um, people are trying to, like, that are saying All Lives Matter are trying to say, like, well, everybody matters. But yeah, of course, everybody does matter. But people aren't really understanding that people of color matter too, especially our judicial system. So, yeah. All right, and then definitely the next big question is what role does the society have in playing or in creating this issue? And I think what you really have to go back and look at this and understand is that for the longest amount of time, police were always looked upon as ways of heroes and almost had this shield around them that protected them from things that they did wrong. So, and, but now is the issues have become more and more prevalent and you see more and more problems. You can't turn your cheek anymore. And another big thing is that minorities for years have always been targeted uh, unwarrantedly by white officers more often, but yet again, it's always been turned in cheek to it just because you always look at police officers as heroes until now. Um, some of the really big telling statistics that I thought was um, officers' lack of responsibility led to an increase in the number of cop shootings. The Department of Justice actually saw that 84% of police officers reported that they've seen college, colleagues use excessive force on civilians. So basically, not only are they turning their cheek to that, but they're basically only adding to the problem by not telling anyone anything. So, and then according, another big thing is that according to a Gallup poll this, uh, in the last 22 years, right now the year we live in, this is the lowest police rating that, and confidence rating is since 1993, I believe. So it's only going down as where we should be going up and having more faith in our police officers to conduct their job. All right, so what are some possible ways of addressing the issue? So ways that we can like come up to try to prevent from more lives being taken away are like producing a better police training so that the use of force is reduced and like that because I believe there are ways that people that police officers could do their job without having to use their guns every time. So I think that there should be better training in how to use force and how to arrest someone without having to jump to using gun violence. Also, uh, require police officers to take a psychology or, or especially a sociology course because a sociology course will help them be a little bit more open-minded about different people and their backgrounds. And then also for other solutions we have are make police officers have to face trial if they happen to kill someone if there's not enough evidence. And I also put that there should uh, be required to wear body cameras because I mean I think they are supposed to have wear them either way but they're not most of the time they turn them off so if you have if you require them to wear them and maybe like even uh, make them have to face charges if they don't then that can just like solve the whole problem because they they'll have the evidence on the camera and there won't be big uh, debates about it because it could just be seen on the <coughs> And this is a, a graph about police training, and it's just basically saying like how many, like the amount of people that think that there should be a better police training because it could possibly reduce all these deaths happening. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thank you. from 50s to today. And um, in the 50s, this is when the theme of the perfect wives and ideal homes was prominent. In the 60s, um, there's still that ideal family that was portrayed in the media, but when women were starting to become more prominent in fields that were originally just for men. In the 70s, women were now heavily protesting for equality and feminism was rising. Uh, in the 80s, women were now earning undergrad college degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees. Um, and they were also <coughs> entering fields of science, engineering, law, and agriculture. Okay, in the 90s, women's participation in the workforce grew 60% according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. And 2000s to today, uh, there are still defining characteristics of women's roles in society portrayed in media, but we've come a long way, I suppose. Okay, so um, in the 50s, um, here are some printed ads from the 50s and see if you can spot a trend. Okay, so 
So in the 1950s, men were coming home from World War II and taking back their jobs because, of course, during the time that men were away, women were forced to take over. Um, women were now expected to take care of the household and children. And since women were the ones at home with the television, ads were usually directed towards women. Um, really, the goal of media was shown that a woman's job was to make the husband and children happy. Um, there was also the fear that if women weren't at home, the children would be deprived of a parent. So this ad um, shows um, a woman's <coughs> role at home. <coughs> The day the evening service started and I'm over. Busy, 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 busy,
There's one person nobody can resist, and that's a baby. So love made baby soft with the innocent scent of a cuddly, clean baby that grew up very sexy and foaming bad body lotion, body powder, and body mist. So innocent it may well be the sexy. And the the car ad that reads spread your legs. <coughs> um, go back. Uh, the other ads include, uh, include obvious sexism, like uh, the one, I think this is for a shoe company, and the one for cigarettes. It says, um, blow it in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. And they also include a uh, harsh uh, body shaming, like uh, the one that says, that's no shape for a girl. And something I found in a book source was that 75% of ads using females were for uh, bathroom or kitchen products, like this one that's for a, uh, an oven that says it's a wife saver. So in the 1980s, ads aren't only implying that women need to stay home and cook anymore. And now restaurants are advertising, like as a family outing, you can go out to dinner. And so I'm going to show this kind of scary McDonald's ad. <laughs> We're America's favorite, number one. What else could you have so much fun? <laughs> it's just one place, just one place you can go where it's fun to eat and talk. especially due to the fact that um, major icons in the media were promoting it, such as Madonna and Tyra Banks, who was the first non-white female to be advertised for a major cosmetics company during this time, this decade. So um, the whole mindset of I don't need a man became very popular, and the idea of reverse sexism was very popular during this time, just because they were over being hypersexualized. And in contribution to that, researchers and psychologists put blame on ads for the rising trends in um, eating disorders, such as bulimia and anorexia nervosa. And so to put um, women in a better light, a lot of women began to get key positions in media or in advertising companies and to get the direction off of hypersexualizing. Okay, so there's some pretty conflicting images from the early 2000s till today. So during the early 2000s, companies and society really started to see how much sex sells. In these ads, you can see how a lot of ads evoke the idea that men are dominant and women should want to please them. Also, almost all the adult <laughs> ads look like some type of sex is about to happen. Um, so you, uh, if you buy their products, you'll be a lot hotter and more men will want you. Uh, the ad, though, that I actually found to be the most distasteful was the Eric Romney and Fitch ad because their target audience uh, for this clothing store is preteens and sometimes even children. Uh, the type of ads have a very negative effect on our youth, and mostly preteens and teens are unsatisfied with their bodies due to these types of ads. So, um, now in today's culture though, many companies still use the idea that sex sells, but some have um, switched more into a, a woman's empowerment um, view. Um, 
power, they decided to show women as equal to men and give powerful messages that women are no less than men. Two companies that are really making way with this are Nike and Dove. Most of you know about the Dove's Real Body Challenge, but everyone, but not everybody knows about Nike Hashtag Better for a Campaign, which is an ad series that show women are just as strong and capable as men in the athletic field, and both of these companies are helping to create a better representation of women and a better future. So for our conclusion, we have two different types of ads. Um, they really just show how harmful it can be to show women in this life. Your coffee really is burning. Putting a woman behind the wheel of a car? How absurd. Polyglass means more than mileage when your wife has to drive alone. <laughs> She can't do much, but thanks to Xerox, she doesn't need to. I can't type. I don't take dictation. I won't sharpen pencil. I can't file. My boss calls me indispensable. Miss Jones. Just a minute. Will you make a copy of this? Naturally. from our past and we still have sexism today and here's an ad from today which could be sexism in our future. If your acne has seen it all, it's time to see what light can do. New Neutrogena Light Therapy Acne Mask. With the clinically proven light therapy dermatologist use, it's blue light. I don't know if this really works, but Here are six of the funniest commercials that were a bit too risque for TV. Groups. 
and they can, this can be a result of our own observation or adopted from the influence of significant <coughs> others such as family, friends, co-workers, teachers, and media. Due to the many simplifications and general, generalizations that they produce, stereotypes present incomplete and subjective and sometimes false images of reality. And then I have a picture of the um, to show like marginalizing and stereotypes. Um, yes, hi. Girl! 
girls to buy princesses and all the boys rice to buy superheroes. Well, why? Because <coughs> girls want superheroes and the boys want superheroes and the girls want pink stuff and the girls and the boys want and the boys don't want pink stuff. Boys, well, boys want both, but why do you think they do that? Because uh, cause the companies who make these try to trick the girls in, into buying the pink stuff instead of stuff that boys want to buy, right? Right, but but you can buy either, right? And boys can buy either. If boys want to buy pink, they can buy pink, right? Yeah, so then why don't all the girls have to buy princesses? Some girls like superheroes, some girls like princesses. Some boy like superheroes, some girl, some boy like princesses. Absolutely. So absolutely. Then, why does all the girls have to buy pink stuff and all the boys have to buy pink color stuff? It's a good question, Riley. <laughs> <laughs> So leading off of that video, um, what are the societal consequences and problems related to gender stereotypes? So um, one of them is it becomes normal. And so this is a topic that shouldn't be the norm for our society. And um, because as a global community, there really shouldn't be limitations placed on any specific gender because we all should be equal, we're all humans. Um, this degrades the women as well as the men. So when you do place those stereotypes on women, you're kind of thinking them of them as less than, uh, as less of a person. And when you put stereotypes on men, you're also kind of limiting them and labeling them as less than a person. And so this also creates grouping or cliques within society. So like when you see one woman, you're gonna relate her to what women are perceived to be, which is their stereotype. And when you see one man, you're gonna relate them to what you see all men as, which is their stereotype. Um, it also creates a diversion between people, and those are often inaccurate. So like, we kind of separate ourselves when really we should be together, like in the workplace and in everyday life when we hang out, like we can all be friends. And then um, also if we continue to label and create these gender stereotypes, how will we ever like reach equality between the sexes? So um, it's important to do that because as you saw um, a commercial from the past where we were also reinforcing these stereotypes, and you saw one from the present where we were also still reinforcing the stereotypes. So it's like how will we ever grow as a society if we continue to do this? <coughs> So what are some potential ways of addressing that issue? So the first one, we can unfortunately completely abolish the issue, but we can try and follow, not follow what the media presents um, for the perfect man or the perfect woman. Um, for children, we can start showing them at a young age that and explain to them that it is not okay to stereotype others. And since the media is such a prevalent influence in children's lives, it's extremely likely for them to pick up on the household lifestyles through music and entertainment. Um, it's a good to introduce them to them early. We can watch how we regulate our media and absorb all the TV shows and the websites and the advertisement and the video games we watch. We are also at fault for some of the gender stereotyping because we watch so much media. Um, the video games now are also starting to dehumanize women in there with all their and mini skirts and, <coughs> and stuff like that. So we can reduce our intake of media and just be ourselves and try not to be ashamed for liking <coughs> pink if you're a guy and trying to like superheroes if you're a girl, like the little girl doing this. Um, and so this is a clip from Bad Moms and it, it's an example of all the moms going against society and the beliefs and um, they don't want to be good moms in there. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've seen moms, but so when the moms were just walking in the supermarket, they were going crazy, you know, acting like the normal moms, and when they saw the cardboard cut out of the normal, perfect mom, they kind of just it and like, you know, that's not okay. Um, and now they're going crazy with their vodka. Um, and so also <laughs> with the police officer, she was kind of taking charge instead of the man always taking charge. And so that was a good representation.
right, so uh, basically, society makes it hard for either gender to really truly do what they want to do. Um, from birth, people are immediately assigned to different roles due to their biological sex. Like uh, Little boys uh, are supposed to like the color blue, and the girls are supposed to like the color pink, because they're already are in the room usually with those colors. But this gender assignment occurs and like is evident throughout all four main stages of socialization, like in your family, in education, in your peer groups, and then on mass media, <coughs> it's, uh, it's very prevalent. And uh, like I said before, baby, blue, baby boys are outfitted in blue, while girls are the same in uh, pink. Uh, while male children are often given gifts like trucks, toys, guns, and superhero action figures, which promote motor skills, aggression, and solitary play, Female children are given dolls and dress up apparel that push nurturing, social proximity, and role play. Uh, the female children are supposed to, to uh, are given these dolls because they're supposed to basically, from birth, are, uh, their main goal in life is to be moms, I guess. That's what society wants them to do. And males are like given the opportunity to be more destructive and have more, like be more of a child. Uh, the drive to further turn young boys more masculine is evident in youth sports when the phrase, don't throw like a girl, which if anyone ever played Little League in here, has definitely heard that. Uh, yeah. That's it. Problems. 
Um, children grow up immersed in the media, and therefore many might think that the world revolves around them. There are easier ways to communicate through texting and email, um, but there's, as a result, lack of face-to-face uh, -face communication. Children are made aware of these <coughs> issues, but can also just be easily distracted by local issues. So, for example, news of war in the Middle East just as easily known out by the show Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Um, there's a quote about children in Spain regarding their media usage and how it affects them. Quote, finally, regarding online safety for teenagers, the study from the Gar Media shows that information is given away to an increasing extent. One in ten teenagers are said to suffer from racism, promotion of anorexia and bulimia. Uh, it's more difficult for the younger generation to acquire necessary people skills. Um, many have short attention spans, and patients suffer from social anxiety, which is answered with low levels of support. Ultimately, all are confused by style habits. Um, one quote from a journal called The Effects of Old and New Media on Children's Weight states that uh, television and movies may indeed decrease children's energy expenditure or increase their calorie intake, the exposure to high calorie food advertising, end quote. Um, so in conclusion with that idea, children grow up addicted to technology, and as a result, many develop a dependency on it. And with that dependency comes unhealthy lifestyles, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So I did, what role did the media play in creating this issue? And obviously we have like a big oversaturation of media, so there's just like so much media anywhere you go, like you can't even walk outside without there being media. This is Times Square. You can see just like how obnoxious almost it is. There's so many advertisements and um, publicity. And um, also I found that the corporations are starting to target the youth. So for example, like Amazon's new tablet, they made a kid's version of it, which makes it like easier to access media and the internet, which to me is like um, just fueling the problem because it's already so easy for children to access media and they're making it even easier, ideally. And that's just a part of their marketing system because like obviously many corporations are starting to target the youth because clearly as a generation we are already good, so they're starting to work on uh, the next one. And this is part two. And um, in my research, I found that the American Psychological Association found that violent media leads to aggressive <coughs> attitudes and behavior at a young age. So if like a child is playing with violent video games or listening to violent music at a younger age, then later in life, they're like more inclined to show violent behaviors, such as like um, they're more likely to get into a fight or just have like a more aggressive attitude <coughs> overall. And media is still accelerating at an alarming rate. So if this is how much like media we have now, imagine what it's like in like 10 to 20 years, especially with the younger generation um, expecting this much out of media. They're just going to start demanding more and more and more. So media is going to continue to have to evolve. And the accessibility of media, pretty much anyone can access it. It's like not hard at all to go to a public library or look at your phone and, and find out pretty much exactly what you want to know. Then I had a quote from Malcolm X, which is, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses, which is, to me, the <coughs> perspective, how much power we're putting into kids' hands when they have access to this much knowledge at such a young age and how harmful it can be in their development. <coughs> okay, so what is society's role in this issue? Um, we ourselves are so fascinated with media and technology and staying current with trends in the next big thing. Um, media technology has been normalized within society to sometimes we don't even realize how much we rely on it and how it's implemented into our daily lives. Um, about this concept that has been discussed throughout this course and throughout the semester is how much media is too much media, um, causing unclear limitations on the uses um, society is bringing children into our world where technology is so commonly used towards um, normalized within their lives, uh, which poses the question, how can we raise children to properly use media technology when we ourselves don't know how to like, correctly use it, since it's still progressing <coughs> and accelerated, right? And Jacqueline Howard, who is a journalist for the Huntington Post, said a new report reveals that adults in the United States devote about 10 hours and 39 minutes each day to consuming media during the first quarter of this year. And a 2010 study from the Kaiser Foundation showed that elementary age children use on average 7.5 hours per day of entertainment technology. And this shows that if young adults can't go into adulthood, don't have a proper 
health and healthy balance, how can we expect that kids being born into this new generation of technology are going to find a new medium? Um, to conclude our presentation, she has like a short video. oh yeah, there's a really short clip on um, just how surrounded media is. <laughs> Um, okay, so to conclude our presentation, we would like to discuss the many ways in which society can work on addressing this issue. Um, an important factor um, in addressing is by just spreading overall awareness, inf informing society on effects and studies on children and media technology. Um, parents and administrative figures, um, along with institutions, play a huge role on a child's life and their development. Um, these figures should be aware of not only the effects, but how much media a child is being exposed to. Um, due to the knowledge they obtain, they can then s therefore spread awareness. Um, parents will be, then be able to supervise their child's media technology usage um, with their own discretion, deciding what they <coughs> deem or consider safe, uh, proper usage, or appropriate. Um, every family is different, and they will monitor their children differently. But by making them aware, they can then do this accordingly. <coughs> Um, administrative figures in schools um, can work in educating children on the safety of media and how to use it safely um, within the classroom and outside the classroom, and they can also implement like through assemblies. Um, children are learn by observing others and to help address this issue, just like by leading by example, um, and just like overall by educating ourselves, we can act as role models towards these children. Um, Dimitri Christox wrote an academic journal entitled The Effects of Infant Media Usage, What We Know and What We Should Learn. Um, he stated the quote, parents themselves need to learn um, to be better informed about the activity, what activities really do promote healthy development in their young children. This may provide some defense against the aggressive marketing techniques being employed and has implications beyond the use of media in terms of promoting health development. Recently, France has taken the step in banning programming directed at infants. Finally, more resources need to be made available to fund clinical research related to the effects of media on young children. And this quote just basically um, supports our ideas of how just like spreading overall awareness by funding clinical research and just educating the overall public will really aid in the issues of media and technology within our society. Um, he posed that uh, the steps France has taken um, we don't necessarily have an opinion on whether this is the right steps or enough research to understand if it's the right steps, but we do feel that um, steps need to be taken in the right direction of awareness. Okay, so thanks again, everyone, for those uh, great presentations. I'm going to pass back uh, the uh, presentation evaluations from last week again. Everybody did very well. Uh, so uh, instead of trying to pass it out to individual members, if I, I'll just say, you know, like Team One, Children and Social Media. Somebody raise your hand. Multiple people. I'll hand your copies to that person. So uh, uh, this is from last week. Children and Social Media, Team One. The first ones to go last week here. Uh, team two, gender and sports media. Team three, from last week, body image. Uh, four, last week, violence and video games. And five, stereotyping in media. And six, media and children focus on advertisements. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to talk to me. Uh, that is going to do it for this semester. Unfortunately, I will not be back with you next semester, but I will see many of you, of course, uh, in future comms classes. And for those who aren't comms majors, it was a pleasure uh, getting to know some of you and having you in this class. And I hope you enjoy your spring and especially enjoy your break. So have a great rest of the semester.